talk about what it's like when you give someone your word in business? I mean, that's what makes up whole reputations. That's what is the bond between two people in a business relationship. And if it's broken, no good thing can come of it. Well, hello there. It's Jill Salzman here to talk to you about my business blunders, ways that entrepreneurs shine, and valuable lessons about growing your biz. This week, I want to tell you a story that I've never told anyone because I've been too ashamed and embarrassed to admit it. It's a story about a major record label, a very famous musician, and a promise that was made to me, one that was not kept, and one that I've done nothing about. So why are we shouting this week? Let me tell you why. There was one hard and fast rule at Electra Records, one of the major record labels in New York City where I worked back in the early 2000s. I had the most incredible job that I'd gotten right out of college. I was given the job of being the administrative assistant to the head of the rock department in A&R. A&R, for those of you who don't know, stands for Artists and Repertoire. And we are the department that goes out to find the next big artist. If we like the artist, we bring them in. We hook them up with songwriting teams. We hook them up with producers. And we release their album so that they make sales in the millions of dollars. It was my job by day to sit at a desk and to help my boss do bossy things. By night, I was his second set of ears. He let me go out, and I am still so grateful for this, to five shows a night, seven nights a week. I mean, my salary was so low, it's embarrassing to say. But it didn't matter, because all of my taxi receipts were reimbursed, all of the tickets to get into these venues were reimbursed. I had the time of my life as a kid who loved music to be paid to go out and hear all kinds of music every single night. I had a style to it. I learned this from one of my colleagues. I had two colleagues in the department, by the way. One of them was so wonderful to handhold me through my first few weeks as an a and rep. We would go to a venue, probably having just downed one slice of New York pizza, walked into the venue, stood in the back. You would have to stand in the back to the right or the left of the door. And we would listen. We would watch and we would listen. And within about eight to 12 bars of music, we would know. We would know, oh, this is not good. Or, you know what, it's worth staying a little longer. But usually it wasn't so hot. So we'd look at each other, we'd turn around, and we'd leave. We'd hop in a cab, and off to the next venue we'd go. Let's go! We did this repeatedly, venue after venue, night after night. Once in a blue moon, we'd go back to work the next morning and report to the boss that we'd seen some artist who sounded okay. They sounded pretty good. There was potential there. This hard and fast rule at Electra Records was about how no one was allowed to send in what was called unsolicited material. That meant that if you recorded a demo in your basement, you were not allowed to pop that cassette tape in the mail and send it in. If you recorded something in a studio professionally onto a CD and you wanted to put that into the mail, you could not. It would be considered unsolicited. So to be able to send in material, it had to be solicited. It had to be given permission by a go-between, a manager, or an agent, somebody that someone at the label already knew. So you can imagine how many people defied this rule. They thought, you know what? I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to pay attention to that. I'm going to pop my tape in the mail because it's so good. Someone at Electra will hear me. They will love it. We had so many CDs and tapes dropped off every day. They would fill literal garbage bags, which for some reason would sit right next to my desk. I didn't know why they didn't make it into the garbage cans, but they would just sit there. And to a 22-year-old assistant who was working on a computer by day, but who loved music, it was real hard for me not to reach into those bags and pick out those CDs. I turned to my boss one day and I said to him, would you mind if I checked out some of the CDs and tapes that were sent in to us unsolicited? He shrugged. He didn't care. It wasn't going to bother his work. And as long as it wasn't going to bother mine, I was allowed to do it. 
So I remember dragging a huge black garbage bag around the corner to the back of my desk, where, slowly but surely, I would be getting through the bag. And I started redirecting the mail person to drop off those garbage bags right behind my desk so that I could just go through them. I'd pop a CD into the player. I'd listen to, oh, I don't know, eight to 12 bars. And I knew, oh, this one sucks. I'd pull it out of the machine. I'd throw it into the garbage where it belonged. I tell you all of this because there was one CD that I popped into the player. And after the first four bars, I knew that it was good. I popped the CD out of the player so that I could get a glimpse at who I was listening to. And I thought that the name was misspelled. The first name was written in big Sharpie letters, J-A-S-O-N. And when I looked at the last name, I thought that somebody had scribbled it down too fast because it clearly was missing a vowel. All it said was M-R-A-Z. And I didn't really understand why somebody misspelled the artist's name. I put it back into my player. I listened through that first song again. It was called You and I Both. And I called my boss. In fact, that's a lie. I I am my boss, who literally from his office could see me I aming him, but that's the way he liked it. And I said to him, I think you need to get this guy in here. I played him the song. He looked at me and he said, call him. So I did. I dialed the number for Jason Mraz, which was right below his name on that CD. And I said, are you available anytime this week? My boss at Elektra Records would like to hear you. And I was so excited for him to come to the office. Of course, he immediately said yes. He was in the office in the next few days. And when he performed that song for my boss, you could see in my boss's eyes, he knew he had a hit on his hands. He knew that this was something good. So that day that Jason Mraz performed, he left the office. I walked in to see what my boss wanted me to do next. And he looked at me and he said, you know what, Jill? If this goes anywhere, if this happens with this artist, I'm not only going to give you a raise, but I'm going to give you some points on that album. Points essentially mean a percentage of the royalties that the album is going to make. So again, I was a kid. Did I care so much? Not really. Did we have that in writing? No. But it was a very exciting idea that I would be promoted, that I would be recognized not only by my boss and the Rays, but I would be recognized the world over because everyone in the industry would know that I'm the one who discovered him. Lo and behold, we set Jason up with a couple of songwriting teams. It took a few rounds of writing a number of songs before we landed on the songs that ended up being on that first album, if you in fact know who Jason Raz is. It's a great album. And to this day, he's one of my favorite songwriters out there. It just comes to him so easily. Well, you can guess what the next part of my story is. The album was released to huge accolades. Jason started touring that album, and his fame began to grow. You know when somebody is famous enough when you walk in to order a Starbucks coffee, and you hear the artist that you found playing overhead. It's quite moving. Shortly after Jason's album came out, I decided I was going to leave the label. It was around the time that 9-11 hit New York, and I decided I didn't want to stay in that city. By the time that I left the label, you guessed it. I never received that raise. I never received any points on that album. If you open up the liner notes on that first Jason Raz album, I think you can find my name in the list of thank yous. And I'm very, very grateful for being featured in there. But here's the part that I want to impart to you. I have spent decades convincing myself that it was okay. I never got a raise. I never got points because I was just a kid. It was an honor to help someone else get famous. It was an honor to work for my boss. He was an incredible, exceptional boss for a 22-year-old kid. But I've been too embarrassed and too ashamed to talk about the fact that those things that were theoretically going to be provided to me never were, because I didn't think that I deserved them. You can convince yourself that you don't deserve a million things, and the reason I tell you this is because I work with thousands of mom entrepreneurs every day 
who convince themselves that they don't deserve a certain thing that they in fact do deserve. Look for the good so many of us are busy telling ourselves that if we don't get the thing that we work towards, if we don't get the reward or the accolade that we in fact do deserve, it's okay. I can just overlook it. I'm going to move on and get it the next time. It would have been enormously scary for me as a 22-year-old to go up to my boss and demand what I had been promised when in fact there was no paperwork and when in fact to this day I remain grateful for the job that he gave me, for the freedom that he allowed me, and for the ability to actually get an artist signed. But I see it time and time again with the grown women that I work with now. I watch as woman after woman deserves to be featured in a publication, deserves to be mentioned by someone else, deserves to receive the money from the client or the customer. But for one reason or another, she's constantly talking herself out of it. Well, they can't pay me because they have issues with money right now. They can't feature me there because somebody else is probably better. There's always a reason to talk yourself out of the thing that you actually deserve. And I hope to impart to you today, if you're listening right now, that you never, ever need to have a reason to explain away the fact that you didn't get the thing that you deserved. I want you to get that thing. And more than you wanting to get it, you need to know that you rightfully deserve it, that it is yours. And you need to speak up about getting that thing. Years after a lot of fame, success, and touring, I wrote Jason an email. I just wanted to see if he remembered me. I said, hey, Jason, it's Jill. I hope you're enjoying the ride. I am loving what I'm hearing. He wrote back a very gracious email, thanking me again for all of the successes and his appreciation for where he is now. It was a short and sweet email, something that I'll cherish until his next album comes out. But I have to tell you that even though I felt powerless, full of shame and not in control, I think you can do better than I did. You don't call, you don't write, Why not do both? Call me at 708-872-7878. You can text me at the same number, or you can go to jillsalzman.com slash podcast, where you can leave me a voice recording so that I can talk to you in a future episode and give you some solid business advice. Big thanks to Aaron, Amanda, and Lindsay for helping me record this podcast. Shout out to Jason. And thanks to you for listening. I'll see you next week. 